Pray with me. Lord, may the words of my mouth and our meditative thoughts and every movement of our hearts be always pure and pleasing before your eyes, our protector and redeemer, Lord. Amen. You may be seated. So today I have one question and two main major points. So listen for those. <laughs> but the title is The Politician Murders the Prophet. And it is from Mark chapter 6, beginning with the 14th verse, as we continue on in our look in Mark. Humans as a group have always known tragedy, conflict, and trauma. You probably joined me last weekend and early this week in praying for the 12 trapped Thai soccer players and their coach as they e experienced their own trauma, knowing what the team had already endured and hearing the reports about how dangerous the rescue would be made us all really take note and sit on the edge until all were out and far, far away from that flooded cave. Trauma shatters our assumptions of a, a safe world. And if we grow up in a stable home in our early childhood, it's easy to assume that the world is benevolent and that suffering only happens to other people. Traumatic situations also reveal our underlying view of God. Is God a loving God who looks out for you and protects you? Or is God a wrathful God who is more interested in punishing people for their sins? When we undergo trauma, we ask, where is God in this? What role does God play in the rescue of those children or in the protection of one of his prophets, John the Baptist? So our story today, The Politician Murders the Prophet, is found on page 841 in our Blue Bibles. And actually, the story happens much earlier, and, and what it is is an expansion on what happened to John. See, we know that John was imprisoned as early as chapter 1, verse 14. Jesus' mission in Galilee didn't even start until after John was put in prison. Now Herod heard about the successful mission of Jesus' disciples, as we see in verses 12 through 13, and now he thinks Jesus is John whom he murdered. But let's find out who Herod is. This is Herod Antipas, not actually a king, but a tetrarch. Now he is not to be confused with our infamous Herod the Great, who was in search of Jesus as a baby. Herod Antipas was his son, and as tetrarch, that means that there were three other leaders, uh, which is more, it's sort of like Herod is one-fourth of a king. <laughs> Herod's court was known for its excesses. The story of John the Baptist reminds us that the local Jewish pseudo-aristocracy did not take kindly to the presence or the proclamation of an alternative king of the Jews, although that does come later in our story. Thus, it is a story of corruption within Israel. And like the prophets of old, being a successful prophet probably means suffering. Did I say probably? Definitely means suffering, and it means trauma, and maybe even death. If we didn't already know the story of Jesus, we would begin to feel uneasy about him, too. The action takes place in Marcaris, a fortress on the eastern side of the Dead Sea. Now, we know certain details about this story because of Josephus, and he was a historian who wrote in the first century, and he wrote about the history of the Jews. He was born about 37 A.D., Josephus mentions Jesus and John the Baptist, and he tells this particular story. 
but from a slightly different angle. See, G uh, Josephus attributes John's death to Herod's fear that John's great popularity might start a revolution. John's denunciation of the affair with Herodias was really more from a moral or a religious perspective, but Herod could easily have perceived John as a political threat. Mark draws a close parallel between John and Jesus. Some thought Jesus was Elijah or a prominent prophet because he did, he, Elijah did not die and he, Elijah was expected before the Messiah was expected to come. And for his part, Herod must have said about Jesus with exasperation, this is John the Baptist all over again. So, my main point. Pleasing God or pleasing people. Herod feared John, but he feared the people more than God. Herod wanted to please them as their presence caused Herod to act contrary to his better judgment. See, many well-to-do folks fancying themselves as patrons of intellectual pursuits supported philosophers for their cultural and entertainment purposes, but no one would hire a prophet of God because what you get is ethical teaching, and that sounds a whole lot more like meddling. This account reeks of impiety. See, birthday celebrations were considered pagan, and good Jews would not indulge in this way. But to be clear, some assumptions about the nature of the dance is in order. The word used for girl in verse 22 is actually used for a young girl, not more than 12 years old. And as she was the daughter of the king, it's not likely that this was a sensual kind of dance. And that's what we normally read it as and assume it to be. That's what I thought before I dug into my commentaries. So we should not be thinking in that way. But I would say it is safe to say that alcohol would have had a big part in this celebration and it could, be, it could lead Herod to this careless vow. As I said, Herod's court was known for its excesses. But there's an irony in Herod's boast. He promised this daughter or half-daughter who pleased him with her dancing whatever she wanted up to half the kingdom. But Herod's oath is not backed up with adequate authority. A Roman vassal has no authority to give away any of the kingdom. It's not his to give away. John was executed without a trial and with the utmost of haste. So even as we ask, where is God in this? How is God going to protect his prophet? We must not forget Herodias, who had a grudge against John and had wanted to put him to death, but couldn't find a way to do it. See, Herodias was a jealous, ambitious schemer and we know that for a fact because she is the one who encouraged her husband to appeal to Rome for the title of king. And that happened later in AD 39. Instead, the Romans banished them. Now, when we reflect on the role of Herodias and a prophet, our mind quickly goes back to another famous evil woman, Jezebel and her hatred towards Elijah. Pleasing God or pleasing people. This was the dilemma presented to Herod, and we see his choice. Verse 26, And the king was exceedingly sorry, but because of his oaths and his guests, he did not want to break his word to her. Now, it is true that oaths were not easily broken, but... He is the one in charge, I say, and he could have found some excuse out of the situation. But rather than pleasing God, Herod chose to please people. It is easier being a people pleaser than being a God pleaser. 
But that kind of life is filled with regret. The fate of John the Baptist is used by Mark to foreshadow the fate of Jesus, who would soon be handed over and put to death. First, tragedy strikes with the murder of John, and Jesus, his cousin, his situation is heating up as well. Both Jesus and John are put to death by a reluctant political leader who knows that they're innocent, but against his better judgment succumbs to the wishes or the presence of other people. Both Herod Antipas and Pontius Pilate bear witness to the righteous character of their victims. Both Jesus and John are victims of evil. My second point, evil exists. See, there are layers in the Gospel of Mark. If you have eyes to see and ears to hear, you would know the deeper and darker forces which operate at a supernatural level. Forces we are told are demonic and on high alert with Jesus on the scene. We are introduced to Satan in the first chapter as he sought to tempt Jesus in the desert. The shrieking demons that yell at Jesus from a synagogue and the ones that rush on him out of the tombs are signs that a battle has been joined. Even the dark, stormy seas, the very depiction of evil, which is untamable, which chapter 4, must bow in submission to the Lord of the universe. In the story just before this one, Jesus had given his disciples authority over the demonic, a ministry that they had performed with success. Verse 13, and they cast out many demons and anointed with oil many who were sick and healed them. But the forces of evil are not yet vanquished, and they get to do what they want by using people's careless oaths and evil requests for the death of a prophet. John the Baptist's death was not inevitable, but it's also not surprising. Evil exists, and sometimes evil gets to call the shots. And many times we are left in a situation where we might ask the question about the redemptive purposes of an evil action being allowed to happen is if God is a loving God, wouldn't God protect them? Or if God is a wrathful God, does that mean the person who suffered actually deserved it because they were a sinner? We ask, where is God in this? What role does God play in the protection of one of his prophets, John the Baptist? Now, even while we heartily proclaim God's sovereign rule, we need to see that not every single thing that happens is necessarily God's expressed will. Notice in the Lord's Prayer how we pray for God's will to be done on earth as it is done in heaven. Isn't this a specific prayer, a petition, asking God, because there are times when God's will is not the thing that is done. There is evil, and sometimes evil gets to do the things that evil wants, like having John killed. Make mo no mistake, I am not challenging God's omnipotence. We still search for answers, though. We might never understand what purpose came about from the evil thing happening or we might, by chance, be in a situation that, looking back, we see the way God has taken what Satan meant for evil and turned it into something good. That's, that is what the Lord is good at. That and walking through the evil with us. But even if we are afforded this backward look with wisdom, it is a gift that comes from God himself. And maybe, just maybe, we get a glimpse of this bigger picture and the purposes that God wills for the good in a bigger overall picture. 
Of course, you already know that I will proclaim that God is a loving God who looks out for us and protects us. Sometimes that protection might be seen in the protection of life. And sometimes that protection is the protection of our souls, which cannot be harmed by any evil action. God reserves his wrath towards evil itself and Satan, the one who tempts people to evil. And have you noticed something about people who have endured trauma and suffering? The most beautiful people we have known are those who have known defeat, known suffering and loss, and have found their way out of the depths. The most beautiful people are those who are more interested in pleasing God than pleasing people. They are the ones who are willing to love others, to speak truth, and they face the consequences of others who might wish them harm because of their truth-telling. So, Lord, may the movement of our hearts be always pure and pleasing to you, regardless of the outcome. Amen.